if you're going to get in to own your own business, then you're going to have to put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. A lot of people think that they're going to quit their day job and start something because they don't want to work for someone and they want to make their own hours and stuff. Sometimes that nine to five job is a lot easier than doing it on your own. You're lazy and you don't want to put in the time. You're not going to have a successful business like that. I can guarantee. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number four of the Rose Bros podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Rose. Centered around a cup of Rose Bros coffee, my goal is to share the stories and life lessons of other entrepreneurs, athletes, and interesting people in general. Today, we are joined by Kirsten Hopkins and her partner, Matt Larson, owners of Hopkins Harvest and The Hotspot, a farm-to-table market and wood-fired pizza oven located in Winnemere, British Columbia. Started in 1995 by Kirsten's father, Fred Hopkins, growing tired of the local supermarket selection of produce brought up from the U.S. and Mexico, spotted a market opportunity to bring in fresh produce from the Okanagan Valley to sell in the Columbia Valley. The market began with humble beginnings, but business grew slowly and the market moved into steadily larger spaces until its current location now, located just off of Highway 95 outside of Windermere, B.C., In 2014, Hopkins Harvest added a wood-fired pizza oven, making some of the best pizzas in the Columbia Valley. Fred Hopkins passed away in 2017, but his daughter Kirsten and partner Matt have continued on the business. In 2019, revenues reached just under $2 million, with Kirsten and Matt continuously thinking of new and exciting products to add. So stay tuned for more info from Hopkins Harvest, as there's a few things coming down the line. Kirsten, Matt, and I talked about the challenges of running a business in a seasonal town, the importance of hard work, and the fulfillment of customers enjoying their high-quality products. It was a great episode, so I hope you enjoy the show. Kirsten, Matt, welcome to the show. Hello. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and go over Hopkins Harvest in the hot spot. I know you're busy. Not much time in the days. Thank you very much for having us probably get most of my vitamin c content when i come and drop by and pick up my fruit (laughs) weekly and monthly thanks to you guys so our business is ever changing (laughs) was owning a business always your goal how did you get into owning hopkins harvest it was not always either of our goals honestly it was not always either of our goals it kind of just fell in our lap when my dad didn't really want to do this forever so he kind of presented the idea like hey guys do you guys want to come and try it out and take over here we are still taking over (laughs) slow (laughs) slow process not easy for sure our business is pretty complex though it's not like we just have one business we have a bunch of businesses all intertwined into one so it gets pretty complicated for us Hopkins Harvest featuring the hot spot. Explain, what is that? Kirsten's been involved with Hopkins Harvest for 25 years yeah. now. Ever since I was Ever a little girl. Yeah, so as a child, helping your dad out. And then we came in. year after we started, we realized this wood oven needed to be put to good use, I guess, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just sitting there doing nothing. So we decided to start throwing some pizzas around one day. But Hopkins Services produce from the Okanagan yes. and Hot Spot is wood-fired. wood-fired pizza wood-fired place, wood-fired yeah. Pizza. yeah. So that's where like the complex side of owning this business is because it's not just the Hot Spot and it's not just the market and it's not just a trucking business because we do go get everything ourselves. It's a whole bunch of everything. So it's really hard to juggle at all. Your dad, Fred Hopkins, started Hopkins Harvest with the idea to bring produce over from the Okanagan. Yeah, exactly. To the, to the valley. Yep. He thought there was obviously demand for fresh produce. Oh, there's a major demand. Our valley, because we have, what, two shipping companies that maybe bring in produce. There's not a lot of options because we're situated. There's no main highway that goes through Invermere. There's, it's a very unique little town. So that's how it all started in, I think I read 1995. Yeah, somewhere around there, 1995, 1996. Since then, you've added the hotspot. Yes. What was the motivation behind that? There wasn't really any. We just, we always had a leaser on this side okay. and leasers were really complicated. And so, so what's we just, that? What's that? someone who leased out the restaurant side of things. Okay. And we just decided that when we were taking over that we didn't want a single leaser involved. 
You wanted to have your own business. We wanted to do it all our own. It's really, it's hard because our kitchen's really small. So to have a leaser, you're like kind of intermingling with them. Okay. And it just gets really ugly and messy. To start out from the beginning, Kirsten, you grew up in the Valley. Yep. You went to high school here, more or less. More or less, yep. Uh, Majority of it. Graduated from here. No, I graduated from Cranbrook. Cranbrook. Did you get into Hopkins Harvest right away? No, no, no. So uh, well, after? I always came back to help my dad. Right. Like in the summer months, I would always come back because it was just a seasonal business. A few years kind of went by that I wasn't really coming back. My older brother tried it out for a bit. My little brother tried it out for a bit. It wasn't for either of them. Mm-hmm. And then we were working up north when we decided, when my dad, my dad was pretty much just saying, hey guys, like your brothers don't want to be involved. So why don't you guys, he just got his class one. We had went up there. The oil field was kind of doing the swing of things so we're like he has his class one which means that he could drive for my dad so we just decided hey well let's just go give it a try matt how about you did you grow up in the valley i don't think no i grew up in cranbrook Cranbrook. down the road got to know kirsten started dating kirsten yeah we met in cranbrook yeah we've known each other for a long time through through school but we ended up meeting at another job in cranbrook got together after that but then that's when we ended up moving to edmonton together and then it kind of um came to a halt price of oil dropped i think it was in 2012 so we lost all of our hours. We were making really good money. And what were you doing up there? What? I was swamping. I was going to be an apprentice crane operator, actually. And then she was kind of heavily into her first aid, doing that kind of thing. That was the direction we were headed in. And then we were kind of lost. This opportunity came up that, you know, her dad was looking to sell. Kirsten was passionate about the business from years of being here and yep. helping him out and stuff. So she decided or asked me. She did ask yeah. me. She looked at me. She looked at me. She said, hey, what do you think about going down there and trying it out for a summer? I was like, well, it can't hurt. I mean, we're kind yeah. of in a crappy situation right now. So, yeah. And we, you know, free rent, free rent for a while at our parents' place. And that helped us out. And then, yeah, sure enough, we kind of fell in love with it and okay. started slowly taking it over in our own our own way trying to and matt when you were growing up did you always kind of envision yourself owning a business or was entrepreneurship (laughs) never in the cards never was uh, something that i imagined myself doing was being an entrepreneur but i actually quickly realized that it was something enjoy that i enjoyed and i was good at it's something that kirsten and i are both good at is selling very good at it You've noticed that you kind of like it. I just like it. I like engaging with people, showing them an amazing product that we've decided to bring in for these people and really selling the product. But it's, it's easy, easy to sell things that are, that are good and, and, and like they speak for themselves basically in the quality and in the, the way they were grown or raised or everything like that, right? So right. we just are the ones that uh, hand it over. Right. <laughs> You've taken it over the story originally, Fred Hopkins. We can get into kind of the transition and whatnot. How did he get it going? Was it did he grow up in a, in the Okanagan? I don't. Uh, yeah. So my my dad's originally from the Okanagan, and that was why when we first moved to the valley, my dad was pretty much fed up with the grocery stores. They were charging an arm and a leg for really shit produce, okay. like just not good quality, expensive. It's coming from America. And growing in the Okanagan, he knew really good fruits, really good produce, really good meats. And he's a farmer. And he was like, well, I, you know what? Kid says on every web page and everything you see, it's a truck and an idea. And he literally turned to my mom and was like, look, I'm going to buy a truck. I'm going to make a go at selling vegetables out of the side of my truck okay and it was a rough few years kind of getting his foot in the door because he was kicked out of Invermere he wasn't allowed to sell in Invermere he's yeah IGA didn't want him there at the time obvious reasons Mm -hmm. so they got him kicked out of Invermere he sold in Kootenai Park for a little while at the there's like a lodge halfway through the Kootenai Park so he sold there for a bit and then he got a gig with the Lions Club and he was able to sell fruit by like the ball diamonds there for probably only about four years and then we moved to the bowling alley and we sold, they built a little addition on the side of the bowling alley and we sold it out of the side of the bowling alley, bowling alley. So we were in a building now. It was too small. My dad's dream was to be way bigger from what you kind of see right now. This was his ultimate dream. Yeah. And so then we finally moved here and we've been here for about 16 years, probably. Right. Like the timeline's kind of correct. 14 to 16 yeah. years. How old was your dad when he got into that? Middle aged. He was about 35, probably. He was an engineer and he worked for a lot of, he was a town foreman, Calgary, Salmon Arm, Mm -hmm. Grand Prairie. It just, he was born to do his own thing. Mm -hmm. He was an entrepreneur. He was determined. He always clashed with anybody that was a higher up than him and he knew that he had to just do it on his own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why he got into this. So he was middle aged at the time. Yeah. 
Oh, it was a major, it was a big decision right. for our family, for sure. Absolutely. Huge decision. Why produce? He enjoyed? Because he's from the Okanagan. And he was like, it's just, there's nothing. He He's a very smart, he had connections okay. and he was a very intelligent man. He was yep. super intelligent. He could see what the Valley needed and he knew that he would make a difference and an impact. Right. So that was the way my dad was. Kind of spotted the opportunity yeah, and, and took for it. it and, exactly. But at the time, you guys were nowhere. To, no. You know, not you weren't in the picture. No. I remember, Kirsten, you were always in the Super New Basketball. Always, yep. Did you think that was where <laughs> yeah, you headed? Or? I had no idea, honestly. My dad was, he was my best friend. He really pushed me to play basketball, which I loved. And mm -hmm. he was like my, he was my drive for sure. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved to Cranbrook, I played for a few years there. And I knew that I wasn't, I wasn't really ready to go to school. Yep. I, I just... I wasn't ready for it. I didn't know what I would take. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of opportunities, but I just, I wasn't going to take the plunge. So I just chose to travel and came back and worked for my dad in the summers. Kind of like we were saying, just fell into it more or yeah, less. Yeah, <laughs> literally just <laughs> kind of fell into it. <laughs> it's crazy, actually. As far as produce and selection of products, how does that work? So basically, Fred, the biggest part about our business is that we go and get everything ourselves, right? Who's we? The person and I. Okay. I go to drive now because i have the nice part about me coming into the business is i have my class one okay filling up that 40 foot trailer packed every week with fruit and produce all from connections that fred had created and friendships that he had made throughout the years with these farmers because some of some of them are actually you know they grow some really good high quality produce but they're they can be very stubborn because they don't trust people yep. for whatever reason i mean this is their fruit that they grow this is their product fred was managed to find some of the best growers in the valley in the okanagan valley and we were lucky enough to have obtained those from him and to continue on those relationships right some of the quality and creating new ones along the way of right. course yeah for sure but he he got the he made a good yeah. name for hopkins harvest in the okanagan it speaks for itself just so, it's all about the connections and the friendships that you make with these farmers and and yeah you see some really good product coming out of there okanagan valley meaning kind of Kelowna to yeah most, mostly we source it yeah salmon arm north okanagan all the way to south okanagan and soyuz all over area most okay. of the tree fruits come from the the hotter south soyuz and oliver and those areas right and then uh we we get all kinds of stuff all the way back down to salmon arms so right. berries and all kinds of stuff uh, mostly Lots. produce obviously yeah yep. fruit produce yeah but we do we kind of kind of turned into like almost a specialty market like another relationship and a really big one of ours is with the dutchman dairy and that's one that fred you know he grew up with the duets playing softball and baseball and stuff like that that was, that was a really big one too and people love that stuff it's it's a really popular yeah. product here <laughs> yeah so all kinds of stuff farm crest foods is a chicken supplier and salmon arm a lot of places fred grew up in right as a business selling produce in a tourist town seasonality is a bit of an issue do you guys how do you deal with that there's no really real way of dealing with it it's so up and down it's a roller coaster ride right now you mm -hmm. know what i mean this is like our slowest time of year so a big reason why we started the hotspot was to try and sustain ourselves year round my dad was only ever a seasonal business and we weren't wanting to go and jump on board working for somebody else that wasn't kind of what we were here to do and we tried to turn it into something that is sustainable year round which i mean it is every year it gets a little bit better we also our business is situated outside of invermere so invermere is very much they're, the people in Invermere are very routined. My dad always said, if you live in Edgewater, you're going to pull up at the set of lights and you're going to turn left. You're never going to turn right. Where we're situated, our business is rocking in the summer because you have nothing but people from Windermere. Like half of Windermere is owned by Albertans. It's not locals because it's, too, it's so expensive to live here. It's a catch-22 for us. We're constantly doing implementing new things to try and bring people in you know like i said specialty market right or like matt said specialty market so we have good quality meats good quality produce and obviously this time of year is hard just unique items that other people in the valley don't carry but it is hard the hot spot has really created a name for us thank goodness to get us through the winters it's still very difficult so when you say difficult like what's the drop off 50 percent? oh more than that probably 75 it's about 75 to 80 percent probably which is astronomical. It's a huge, huge. number because your overhead is still the exact same as it is in the summer. Right. So your operating costs are all the exact same. You still have your year round staff, yeah. but you still have your year round staff Absolutely. that you have to support, which are families in the valley that you really don't want to lose. So if you're going to be a sustainable year round business, you want 
really good staff because it's hard to find because it is so seasonal. They jump onto golf courses. They jump onto ski hills. It's hard to find good staff. So staffing has been a, been oh, a huge headache. issue. So what do you do? Do you local ads? Do you post online? Word of mouth. We're really good to our staff. Yeah. Word of mouth is a big one for us. Okay. Have you noticed kind of trying to create a Hopkins culture has been a goal? Do you guys think of that? Kind it's of our a, family. We overall. always say it. It's a Hopkins family. If you work for us, you're part of our family. And have you noticed that helps? Oh, yeah. Majorly. Retaining staff. But then even still, you can never predict. You just never know. A lot of lessons have been learned. Do you notice turnover high, low? Is it? It's one thing that I've learned recently that you cannot predict, even when you think you have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing we were learning as we go. And you never are going to learn it all or know it all. It's, so give it's us a hard example. question to answer. Can yeah. you give an example of anything along those lines without naming names? or This business and for a full-time employee is very, it can be difficult. Yep. It's not the easiest industry to work in, being a restaurant. Being a full-time chef, and it's a lot different here. You work, for example, long hours all day, six days a week sometimes, you know, or more. In the summer when we're doing the produce side of things, we are relying heavily on students because it's a seasonal opportunity right and you know you do find some good students but there's also some that we've all been there probably. i don't know how else. yeah it's exactly so i mean i was there once too right but it's you know it can be very frustrating as a small business because as the you, owner as the owner and you know something crazy too now is and this is something Curtis and I've talked about heavily is this new increase in wage, which, you know, is important for a lot of people. But when you're having so to what's pay, that? The minimum wage is um, going up $15 an hour, right? So in British Columbia. Yeah. You know, we're going to have to pay uh, sometimes a 13 year old that's never had a job before $15 an hour. Whereas, you know, I understand if it's like, you know, a single mom or dad that needs a that needs a job to support a child in a household. Like I get that. But it's really tough for us having to. Cause, you know, we've what, like 20, 20 or more employees in the summer because we have a lot of things to do. And then for full-time employees, it's it's just tough trying to keep them year-round because of the you know the season, seasonal right. effect, I guess. Yeah. Getting back to the business, what are you guys at now? Are you as a privately owned company? Is how has revenue been? Is it? Can you get into that at all? Or because you- we've taken on the hot spot and with the transitions of it's been an interesting few years with the loss of my dad and then my mom becoming the executor of my dad's will and everything just going into my mom's name. The transitions have not been easy for Matt and I because we're putting in a lot of time and effort. We're not impatient, but we want it to be ours. If, if we're putting in all this time and this effort, we do want it to be ours. For the first time, Hopkins Harvest and the Hotspot are actually doing really well on books-wise. We're doing really well. It's a lot of work for us, though. And for it to not be in our name, it was a major struggle. So recently, we did just sign the papers for Hopkins Harvest to be legitimately ours, which, I mean, we, my parents were always really good about letting us run with it, kind of do what we want and stuff. But it's the underlying factor when we're wanting to adjust our liquor license, we have to go through my mom or my dad. Whereas like we want to be able to just do it, get it done and move on. It's little things like that. But Hopkins Harvest is and the hotspot. We're doing good. It's hard for us because we're constantly, we go home. I mean, we go home and last night we had a bottle of wine and talked till 1230 about the business. What are we going to do? Is this what we want to do? Is Because it's not easy. It's really not easy at all. It doesn't matter. Numbers, whatever. It's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. A lot of work. It's a lifestyle. Could you imagine working for somebody else? Oh, no, we would never work for anybody else. (laughs) So not anymore. Yeah, once you get a taste for it, it's kind of... It seems to be a common theme with small business owners and entrepreneurs. It's not easy. Could you imagine working... You'd never be a valued employee. That's the thing. Because you know what you are worth and going... We always say it. Like, if we went and worked for somebody, they would be lucky to have us. Because we would literally bust her ass for them mm-hmm. and or, i know or, we wouldn't get or paid. you wouldn't right or we you wouldn't know, there's yeah a, there's that motivation no i don't i don't think knowing us i really <laughs> depending upon who it is i might just literally just quit the job but Absolutely. i would literally bust my ass for somebody yeah i know i would mm-hmm. and then if i wasn't being appreciated i'd move on to the next <laughs> but that's not what we want to do no. by any means no. we love hopkins harvest we do it's trying to make it a healthier lifestyle for yourself not working 16 hours a day <laughs> seven days a week <laughs> Because right. oh. we did that for a couple of years. You can only do that for so long before you start to burn yourself out. And then you start to not enjoy what you were doing anymore. Yep. So you got you to watch out for that because it's easy to get into that and, and so fall what, into that trap. So What kind of hours are you guys working now? Every day still, but it's less hours a day. We just, we just know that as long as you're conscious of that and making sure that your health, healthy lifestyle 
is more important than <laughs> than the next pizza sold or the next bag of peaches. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to the transition of Fred Hopkins to Kirsten Hopkins and Matt, tough times you were talking about. Can you get in a bit of that? The hardest part was the loss of my father because it's funny, like when he was alive, we were so keen on having him retire and you know like you retire dad like you don't need to work so hard and then we lose dad and it's man i could use my dad around right now just for like the little things he would get up every morning at 6 a.m be here pressure wash make sure he took pride like a lot pride was like his like his word and he would be here pressure washing made sure the store looked good before it opened he'd take the dump for us it's like the little things you don't really take into consideration because when especially when summer rolls around we do have to be here to set up the store in the morning it doesn't set up itself. And then we do have to be here to tear it down at night because yeah. it doesn't tear it like it doesn't tear itself down. Right. So that is really hard for us. And you don't really take in, that into consideration until the help is actually gone. There's nobody else that runs the forklift in our establishment. So one of us has to be here. Right. My dad, if my dad is still alive, he'd be like, hey, guys, you guys sleep in, you know, like I'll go set up this door for you. Mm-hmm. Or Matt, you take the this week off. I'll go drive to the Okanagan. I'll go say hi to the farmers. Mm-hmm. It's like that aspect of it. And the big thing that we've been saying lately, especially this last year, the hardest part for us is that we are the fuel under our staffs, under our staff. We are the drive for them. We are that fire. And the fire for us is gone, which was my father. Whether it was good or bad, if we went to my dad about an idea, he would literally tell us like, that's ridiculous. Absolutely not. Or he'd be like, run with it, guys. That's a really good idea. But we don't really have anybody to go to. And we don't really have anybody that's underneath of us being like, guys guys you're slacking off or you know and we are that to all of our staff which is hard which is hard were you ready for that transition when that happened i we wanted it really badly we definitely had been running the business on our own for a while but it's just it's the emotional side of it too like the loss of my dad totally changed who i was my grieving it happened right before summer and i went through an entire summer working my bag off and then all of a sudden I finally find time to grieve in the fall and it was like it was really hard few years it still is hard but it was a very rough go for a little while there Did you find work helps with that oh yeah that's why I was here because I, I felt my dad here and I knew my dad would want me to be here so I I worked even more than I should for sure right we both did in dealing with tough times any inspiration any books any philosophies you guys use <laughs> not really this trial is this is our yeah trial and error figuring things out uh, as you go kind of a, th- of a thing lately to be honest with you it's what's this quote on the wall here it's don't ask me the question unless you want to hear my answer and he used to say that a lot because we would ask him a lot of questions and then he would say he would say <laughs> and after he said that you kind of look at him like oh uh-huh. shit you know you don't have that anymore and it's, that's why it's been tough and so you just kind of have to figure it out on your own and that's a, a difficult thing but it's but it's good because you you learn a lot from it. You learn a lot. Yeah. and caring about what you're doing puts a lot of little a lot of backbone into it. Any yeah. inspiration in particular? Or do you look to anyone else or each other's a big one. There's no other thing I can imagine that inspires me more, to be honest. And the staff now, where where are you at now with that? how many employees does Hawkins have? We have a few part times and then a couple full times, but it's I think I just did payroll for eight. Eight and people right now. What, what will it be in the summer? We go up to about 24 people. 24? Yeah. We wow. try and keep it under 20, but it just ends up being about 24 every year. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a big jump. And that's, no, not all full-time, part-time, a lot of students. But we do, our hours are so long in the summer, and we have so, Matt's on the road majority of the time. I do all the books, so I'm super busy with the books, and plus being here, plus you need a lot of help going forward what's the plan for hopkins as a business no real changes that we know of at this time <laughs> we're, we're constantly like i said we were up till twelve thirty discussing what we really want to see and like what our goals are and where we want to go with this i mean hopkins harvest is my father's legacy which makes it a little bit more of a challenge in a sense i mean because there's if it was a business that we started it's an easier business to just flip and move on and carry on and do something else. But because there's a lot of family ties to it, family business isn't easy. We do love what we do. We just need to find some balance in it and to be able to 
balance is a big one for us. Like I said to Matt yesterday, I don't want, I don't want five years to slip through our fingers. And then all of a sudden we're mid thirties and we're like, holy cow, man, what have we done for the last 15 years of our life? If there's no real progression in our business, then we need to really step back and reanalyze what we want right. moving forward. So how do you strategize that from <sighs> taking your business from a treadmill to more of something you're building and hard work, creating wealth? A lot and- of hours. Really sitting down and thinking about things, you know, like there, we've, we made a lot of decisions that have got us into some situations just from quickly making an answer, thinking it's the right answer. But you should, one thing I've learned is you just got to kind of sit back, analyze every little piece of information that you have and try and make the best decision you can. In order to keep yourselves from staying on a treadmill, any decisions on that, any changes or how do you guys view that? Toughest thing is just this transition of seasons for us. Like we know that once spring comes, so does people, so does the produce. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the most important part to us. You know, this pizza thing is something that we created. It's a nice aspect of the business, but it'll always go back to the core, the core of the business. Yeah franchising anything along those lines thought about it a few years ago but <laughs> other yeah. locations thought about that too, too yet yeah. we really got to simplify things first here before we can move forward somewhere else Kirsten said earlier like the way you know there's just so many aspects to the business you need the right people to be able to move forward hopefully those people can come and fall on our laps here one of these days or we find them <laughs> so people is an important part of very the summer months being the busy times for the business how do you manage the slower times how do you cut back on expenses that's all literally just been a learning curve like we said for the last so the hotspot's been for just over four years now every year we penny pinch a little more and figure out where to crunch some numbers and what to do. We do a lot of, like we said earlier, the Valley is really tough and where we're situated is really hard to bring people out to our establishment, right? So Matt, right now, a big one that we have figured out is being different. And Matt has really got into like sourdough bread, which has been a big one for people. They'll actually drive here, like the gentleman that just walked through that door for a loaf of bread. And if they walk into the door and they buy a loaf of bread, maybe they'll buy a liter of milk or maybe they'll buy some baking, or it's doing things that are different to bring people into our establishment. Yeah, do you own the land? That so you? yes, it's that's been a transition as well. So Hopkins Harvest is its own identity. The building and the property are still in my mother's name, but we are leasing to own, I suppose you could say. The property and the building will be ours, but the transition of it, that's my mom's retirement. Business itself was gifted to us by my father as an inheritance or whatever means that you want to call it. And then the property is my mother's retirement. So Mm -hmm. that is just a lease to own, which is, I mean, we're really lucky that way. We don't rent to anybody. It is, it will be ours. We do see that being our means of retirement one day, perhaps. It's a gamble. Business is a gamble, but we do see it. We do see a light at the end of the tunnel. As business owners, obviously, you guys like to have a family one day, and I would imagine. That's a huge, that's a big one. That's why I mean when I say I don't want to see five years slip through our hands, and then we're in our mid-30s, and we're like, holy, what about a family? That's why we're trying really hard to find balance. It's not easy, like Matt said, without finding people that you can trust to be here to find that balance, because at this point in the in the game, we do it all. We do absolutely every single aspect My dad once said to me, though, not once, all the time, that if you don't know how to do it, you can't teach somebody else how to do it. Mm -hmm. You always have to have a plan B. I would have never taken over the books, but I took them over because if something was to happen, you're not going to have a bookkeeper. You better know how to do your own books. You better know how to do absolutely every aspect of your business because if something happens and you have to let everybody go, you better know how to do it on your own. Finding people that you can trust to do those things is really hard. And so implementing a family is nowhere in the picture at this point (laughs) at all. It may or may not be, but we do. I would love to have a family at one point in my life, but there does need to be some change for sure. What about creating systems for the business so that... So that's a huge one. We've been talking a lot about implementing systems because it's it's not like we have any culinary background. We just taught ourselves how to make really good food and how to make a wicked pizza. We don't know the systems of a kitchen. I mean, we have a whiteboard that we write down things for our Matt to pick up as our orders. Like we don't have, we don't even have a POS system. We're so old fashioned. Old. We implemented a debit and credit card when we opened the hotspot. So four years ago, we were a cash. My dad was so religiously old school that we were a cash only business for 
however many years. So it's just really slow, like super, it's a slow progression in that sense with the systems. And A good read I've come across is The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Hmm. And the idea behind that book is systematizing the business mm-hmm. so that you are able to remove yourself from the business, yeah. aka take a holiday. Which, I might need to read that book. <laughs> yeah. It's something that might be worth considering. Absolutely. A lot of other entrepreneurs have, I think, experienced the same pains as you guys. Oh, for sure. Especially the restaurant industry. The restaurant industry, food and beverage is hands down the hardest business that you could ever get into. <laughs> Absolutely. is. like Matt was saying, a chef A chef's life is not idealistic. You better love making food for people if you want to be a chef. Right. It's long hours. So do you guys take holidays? (laughs) Kind of, sort of. We have to shut down if we take a holiday. Really? Yeah. We'll plan to close the store for at least two weeks so that we could go somewhere because if something happens and we're not here, we don't have people that know what they're doing to be able to fix it. If a fridge breaks down, if things could go wrong, and and Matt and I are the only ones that are here right now that know how to make pizza, so... (laughs) We have to close if we right. want to ever go anywhere. Very little time off right now. Well, not really. Like we, we make sure we take time to ourselves. We go to Seattle a lot. We do a lot of research and development in Seattle. Uh, we went to New York last year around this time. We took one of our, a couple of our staff members to New York, actually did some research and development there. But then again, one of those staff members, both those staff members are no longer with us. So it's, it's really? hard. Yeah, it's it's been a very interesting with what, us. So what happens though, getting specific, what relationships break down trust issues no never trust issues we're like a we're an open book where communication is our number one especially when it comes to staff like if i was just telling our two core staff yesterday that i'd rather our accountant always told us not to build really close relationships with our staff but in the sense because if they go it hurts you more than anything but i do it for the very fact that if they walk through that door and they're in a bad mood I hope that they come and they tell me why they're in a bad mood so that I'm not just like walking on eggshells being like, what is going on? You know, I'd rather them have an open relationship with me and come in and talk to me about what's going on. More or less, I think either they've been in the valley forever and they want out is a big one. Mm -hmm. We found that with a few. Seasonal. Seasonal thing is a huge one. You never really know why someone's going to jump ship. Right. We take really good care of our staff. So it's a matter of them, like I said, either leaving the valley or wanting something totally different, wanting out of the restaurant industry, because that's not easy. <laughs> like I said, it's really long hours. How do you deal with yourself, finding yourself in a position where you have to be the HR person and the business owner and the accountant <laughs> and the inventory manager and everything else? It's hard because who would you, if we didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. And that was something my dad always said. And this business was my dad's everything. He did absolutely everything in this business. He would be on the road and he'd be ordering bread for the store and he didn't even know how much bread we had left at the store because Mm -hmm. it's hard to find people to trust. If I was here doing it on my own, I wouldn't be able to do it. But I'm very thankful that I have Matt and he's super thankful that he has me for the very sense that like he picks up where I lack and I pick up where he lacks and like the relationship is easy. Easy. So kind of necessity is the Major. mother of all invention. Absolutely. You learn it on the go and yeah. that's... You, you just you, fly by the seat of your pants, man. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Every day is a new day and you wake up and you do it again. <laughs> when does it get busy again? Christmas or sorry, spring, yeah. summer? Christmas or? is a really good one for us. The month of December, there's a lot of people around. It's a nice booming month. It kind of gets us through the winter. As soon as cherries are ready, usually as soon as school's out around that time. The weather starts to get nicer. We have some product in our store. People know people know us as a fruit and produce. That's what people know us as. That's what my dad was for however many years. So as soon as we have cherries in our store, that's when people start showing up. It's the spring months starts to get warmer. And exactly, whatnot. exactly. And then you guys start hiring again. Yeah, and then we start hiring usually around May, May long weekend. We start to hire some students. I have like a lot of you community and networking in the Valley is very important. Like going back to like my accountant saying that your friend should never work for you. Everyone that works for me is my friend like, <laughs> yeah. and I wouldn't be able to do it without them. I literally can call some of my friends being like, man, is there any way you can come in today? And mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, no problem. Right. And if I didn't have them, I don't even, I don't even want to know. Like uh, half my friends, they help us on either the market side or the restaurant side and they don't work for me year round, but they're, yeah, no problem. Start, let me know when you need me to come back. Yeah. Lessons. How about, so what are some of the main lessons you've, you've learned over the years? Building good relationships is really important. Perseverance, I guess. Determination. You have to really have a goal, something, a mindset, 
something to work towards. You can't just go into it for no reason, I guess. So yeah. what is the goal for Hopkins Harvard? Well, we've had goals. And that's another thing I've learned is that things change. It's a very, it's one of those businesses that it changes. I don't know why I can't explain it. I don't We're working on that, yeah. but it's, everything changes. We've had different goals in the last five years, every year. So really? it's because something happens, whether it be, you know, a pivotal staff member leaves or uh, there's a death in the family or you know, there's so many things that change the way you think about. How about advice? What would you, what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs and business owners? And Don't give up. Hardships are hardships. You'll get through them. Right. That's a big one. Don't give up. Definitely don't give up. Like if it's something that you want, you'll get there. The thing about it is, is our, like we said, this valley is tough. Like if our business, if we just picked up our business and plunked it in Cranbrook, we would have more sustainability. We wouldn't have our peaks and our valleys, like our ups and our downs and the roller coaster. And it would just be a sustainable, easier functioning. We'd have staff members walking in, one walking out, one the next walking in. Whereas here, it's hard. We are friends with a lot of entrepreneurs in the valley, like really good friends with Sean from Arrowhead. Mm -hmm. And he struggles just like we struggle. Every single one of our entrepreneur friends that are in this valley, they're going through the exact same crap we're going through right now. Guaranteed. And they're going to tell you the same thing. Don't give up. Like, don't give up. Plan for these downfalls. Make sure you plan for them. And if you're a couple years under your belt and you know that you're going into a winter, you better plan for it because it's going to be the exact same as it was the year before that unless something is thrown at you like a death or a persevere like matt said you'll get through it it's not easy though <laughs> but can you imagine yourselves doing anything else lately we have been kind of confused on where we're headed with the business it's funny that yeah you're asking us these questions right now because we're actually going through kind of like a Weird, weird crisis, weird crisis. and it's crisis. i wouldn't i don't even like calling it a crisis but we're kind of lost on where we want to go uh, we know that a change is going to happen but we're just we're very unsure on where and i found myself kirsten, <laughs> kirsten laughs at me but i'm weirdly obsessed with bread <laughs> and sourdough bread to be specific it's very interesting passionate thing for me lately and i think i might continue to evolve that in, into our business to be honest because it's something that i enjoy doing and people enjoy it as well, as far as I know. So potential product line extensions. Yeah. Yes. We're actually, I was actually very interested in making our pizza dough naturally leavened. So okay. no yeast. So can you, yeah, explain that. It's a very um, health beneficial um, aspect when it comes to bread, basically. Okay. So you're not using commercialized yeast. You're actually, you're actually using flour and water and literally just healthy bacteria or lacto that come from the air create a naturally occurring yeast that rises your bread and it's way better for you if you use the right flours and grains and the long fermentations it's easier for people to digest it has way more flavor it just takes a lot more time and patience but it's i think it's super super cool to be honest with you interesting but. bread potentially the future of hopkins harvest well it just kind of makes sense we have this wood oven I think you can do so many different things in there. Like that's where we bake our bread as well. So many different options in that oven. And that's like the whole reason. If we didn't have that oven, we wouldn't be doing pizza. We've always said that. Okay. So that was a huge reason why we did pizza. This pizza, this is a pizza valley. I don't know, it's weird. There's so many pizza places in this small little place. Not sure where Hopkins Harvest is headed, but to summarize the business, organic produce from the Okanagan, potential product line extensions. Yep. Message to other entrepreneurs, if you were to pass anything on to wrap things up, what would you leave other business owners with as far as advice or every business is so different. Does it like you can be an entrepreneur in bread, you can be an entrepreneur, you can have your own accounting firm, you can every the aspect entrepreneur is such a broad term. Mm -hmm. Just because you own your own business doesn't mean that the business next door is the exact same. It's just being a business owner. Don't get into it thinking that, oh yeah, I'm gonna be able to set my own hours nine to five, no problem, sleep in on weekends. It's not what an entrepreneur is. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna get in to own your own business, then you're gonna have to put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I think that a lot of people think that they're gonna quit their day job and start something because they don't wanna work for someone and they wanna make their own hours and stuff. Sometimes that nine to five job is a lot easier than doing it on your own. If mm -hmm. you can work for somebody and you're lazy and you don't want to put in the time, you're not going to have a successful business. I can guarantee you that I can guarantee. I like making good food for people. There's this, the reaction when somebody 
if you if you've created something and some like we've had people come in and I, I'm not trying to gloat here or anything, but they say it's the best pizza they've ever had. It in is their delicious life. pizza. That's the best. I can, 100%. That is why, honestly, I continue to to do things like that. And I find and like we're foodies. We we when we travel, we go and we eat at new restaurants. We try new dishes, and we use that as inspiration in our business as well. The whole reason we have the hotspot is we based a lot of our ideas off of one pizza place that we loved in Oregon when we were there. And then and then we travel to New York, try a bunch of different stuff there, or Seattle all the time. But then, yeah, bringing something back, like a cool idea, and somebody enjoying it as much as you do, this is the best feeling. So the passion kind of yeah, comes in. Totally. And honestly, we got it from my father. My dad used to travel all the time for the market side of things. Like Pike Street Market in Seattle was one of my dad's favorite places. And if you've never been there, it is so cool some of the origins of the best coffee you're oh, on too yeah from a rose exactly, roast perspective exactly, yep. exactly. So yeah. the very first starbucks is right across the road from pike street not Market. only starbucks but a lot of other oh uh, that's oh too. absolutely yeah but that's what i mean like coffee's huge in seattle mm. and culture's huge in seattle and f- local is huge in seattle pike market is amazing mm. for local vendors and local produce fresh cut flowers right. like the inspiration like walking through that market makes you come back here and work just harder than you've ever worked which is blows your mind to even think in my opinion if i could work even harder but if i went to seattle right now and i came back i would have a whole new drive yeah. a whole new oomph behind my step like matt said when somebody walks through that door and they're like that is the best i've ever had that just like that's the fuel for us we don't have my dad anymore, but that is a fuel for sure. Well, Matt and Kirsten, thanks for sitting down. I really Thank you. you guys taking the time. Thank you very much. That's a good place to wrap it up, the inspiration. And appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked what you heard, head over to rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming episodes. You can also find our coffee and chocolate there. Well, we plant one tree for every bag or bar sold through our partnership with One Tree Planted, a non-for-profit organization focused on global reforestation. Otherwise, until next time, happy coffee drinking.